Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth interview for the Flambeau Noir uh, conference. Uh, for those of you who may just be coming aware of the Flambeau Noir conference, this is the International Left Hand Path uh, conference that has been running annually since 2012. Uh, last year it was in Atlanta, Georgia, and this year it will be in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, from the 28th to the 30th of April. I am Helen Arts and I am one of the co-hosts of this conference and today I have the very great honor and a pleasure of uh, having a conversation with one of the Flambeau Noir presenters, a woman uh, who is greatly respected by many and that is Shani Oates. Hello Shani. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Oh. I can still hardly believe it. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> well, let's start off by um, perhaps uh, asking you to give uh, a little bit of an introduction about yourself, uh, you know, to the extent that you're comfortable, of course. Uh, who is Shani Oates? <laughs> Oh, well, that's a, that's a very good question. I suppose, um, like many other people, it's, I find the most difficult thing is to talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. It's easy enough to talk about the work that you do, mm -hmm. but yourself is, is something of an enigma and um, something of an illusion because we are never who we seem to be to others. Mm -hmm. um, to myself, I am a mother, I am a wife, I am a a worker of the arts. I am deeply passionate about the occult world that I have immersed myself in. I research and seek knowledge and I'd like to think that me, the person that walks through each day, is the person that does those things mm -hmm. um, to the best of my capabilities and the person that gets up on stage and speaks to people is just an extension of that person that gets through life each day. Mm. So it's all uh, a beautifully woven pattern. I think we all try to make it so yeah. um, each and every day. Yes. We wake up with that expectation mm -hmm. and that hope that today is another day and we're going to make a difference in that day. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, part of uh, part of that uh, beautifully woven pattern for you uh, is the clan of Tubal Cain and uh, your role within it. Uh, could I ask you to explain a little bit about that for our viewers? Of course. Thank you. Um, the clan is um, it's. It's a very difficult thing to explain in the modern era, I suppose, because it's it's quite an archaic concept um, that um, isn't very um, uh, familiar, I guess, for most people these days. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a system of operation where it's a family. First and foremost, it is a family, and that family exists in a particular tradition with particular goals and particular ethics and ways of working and it holds particular customs and laws and it's quite sacred. And this particular clan, the clan of Tubal Cain, was named such by one of its um, co-workers in the 60s. Um, it is believed to have been founded by Robert Cochrane, but in reality there were um, others behind him and before him that had set everything up in place. Now the 1960s was a fascinating place when everything was beginning to erupt on the occult scene and everything was getting incredibly exciting. There were new freedoms and people coming out in the open and speaking about traditions that had been sort of under the wraps for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And he began to move forward with what he felt was his ancestral birthright and take it out and hopefully encourage other people to take that particular line of work up. And he hoped that his traditions would influence the current scene in his era mm -hmm. uh, that was expanding into new ways of thinking. Um, there were new sciences, there were new psychologies, 
there were new um, movements upon the moon. So everything was a possibility. Um, everything seemed to be up for grabs. So he thought, right, this is the time to actually make a stance, to make, to make who we are known. And he took his clan out there into the public eye and developed it as a particular modality. Um, one that was very much based in English tradition and very sort of um, quite quaint laws, I suppose. And then he um, had a tragic death and his tanist took over and he kept that as a guardian for 30 years. And that's when I came on the scene about 20 years ago. I um, got in contact with John, um, Evan John Jones, mm -hmm. and we struck up a beautiful friendship, um, very long lasting friendship that was um, very meaningful. And he became my mentor and embraced me into his craft. And once I was embraced into his craft, um, he put me in the position of being the next mentor along the line um, within that tradition. And so that's where I am currently at the moment. I'm a teacher in that tradition. I'm um, its virtue holder and its clan matriarch. So I'm the mother of that clan as well as there's a, my own family as well. It's mm -hmm. one big family. Mm -hmm. For uh, people who would like to find out a little bit more about the clan, where do you suggest that they start? Um, well, there is, um, I think there's a, a clan um, dot com site on Perfect. Facebook. Okay. There's also the one on the World Wide Web, that's clan of Tubalcane. Um, and that's dot, I think that's dot co. <laughs> .org. I don't know, I can't actually remember. I'm not very good at remembering things like that. <laughs> but if you put in the clan of Jewel Kane, it does come up very, yes. very um, yeah. obviously. Um, and the links for that are also on the Facebook page. Um, I have my own Facebook page on there as well, and it's listed on there. Mm -hmm. um, so I can be easily found under there. The, the Tanist for the clan, who will be the next um, caretaker, guardian, and mentor. Um, Ulrich Gaston Blinding Golding, he's also on there, um, so all you need to do is look him up too, and he'll have all the websites listed on his site too, um, and lots of inf interesting information on all of those sites altogether that give a lot of background into the kind of work that we do mm -hmm. uh, about our beliefs and practices as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, thank you so much. And I suppose for those who will be attending the conference, uh, perhaps there'll be a few precious minutes of time where uh, people can connect with you personally. And if they have specific questions, they can uh, find a way to get those to you. I hope so. Um, I'm hoping to meet a lot of people at the conference, um, people that are from all different kinds of of the practices within the left-hand path mm -hmm. and the occult world and who are going to be there to be intrigued um, enough to ask everyone questions, right. deep questions, meaningful questions yes. that literally probe and challenge the speakers there because that really is our purpose. Yes. And so I hope that everyone that comes will exploit that and not feel worried or intimidated because at the end of the day, that's, that's our duty to people out there mm -hmm. to actually be able to give them that information mm -hmm. and share it freely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, speaking of the left-hand path, uh, there are a lot of different uh, thoughts out there in terms of what that actually means. What I would like to ask you, Shani, is mm -hmm. what do you see as the defining features of the left-hand path? Um, and, then, and then as a second part to that question, um, what is it and, and, and how would you compare it to the right-hand path, if you would compare it? Okay, um, <clears throat> well, um, it is um, a very profound question and I think it deserves a profound answer. I suppose, really, the way that I would view it, I would have to say that I don't see a sharp distinction between left and right. Mm -hmm. I think it is impossible for anyone to say uh, they are either left-hand path or right-hand path completely. Mm -hmm. I think um, to suggest such a thing is to suggest a complete polarity 
and an unhealthy duality. I think we can lean towards um, aspects of either in our um, occulted world, in the way we choose to practice our beliefs and faith. That is not to say that they are distinct from general life, because you cannot make a distinction between the mundane and so-called profane and sacred. They're all one. But I think that in general, we have some part of our life that is exposed, and I would call that the right-hand path. Um, I think what is hidden for me would be what I would determine as the left-hand path, mm -hmm. what is occulted, what is not seen, what is dark, what is mysterious. It is the things that elude us, that beguile us and seduce us into chasing them. It is that search for knowledge, the search for gnosis, the search for understanding, the search for what is there, the possibilities. And I think when we seek those things, everyone that does that, that pursues that in a meaningful way, that takes up a, a good portion of their life, that is giving that part of their life to the left-hand path. Mm. The right-hand path is, I think, what we share more generally, what we expose as a more um, ordinary and um, less less mysterious way of, of living our life. I think that they both have light. There is black light and white light. Um, they both are made up of that light. So they, they are very different lights. Um, one has a much more um, intimate, which is the left-hand path. It is everything about us that is hidden to ourselves as well as the rest of the world. So that is how I would define the left-hand path. It is the way we follow the inner core of our inner being. Mm -hmm. It is what drives us to become. It is what we strive for to know mm -hmm. and what we feel is the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the burning thing. Mm -hmm. That that drives is the left-hand path, definitely. Right, right, right. So that you know, that aspect of, of the, the, the questioning and uh, the seeking of answers and uh, the making of meaning. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in your, um, along your journey that meanders between, you know, what some people would say are two separate paths, but that's a, a matter of opinion, right? Uh, yeah. you're, you're certainly working on projects and uh, expressing, expressing yourself through certain um, outcomes. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the different projects that you're working on right now? Of course. Um, again, um, part of, of the um, defining elements, I suppose, that you can distinguish slightly within between the left and right mm -hmm. hand path would be the things that, um, that we produce mm -hmm. from ourselves, the things that we create from setting boundaries and breaking those boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's about um, the heretical things, the heterodox things, mm -hmm. um, whereas I would say the right-hand path is more orthodox. So in that, it is the things that we do within a prescribed law, a set from outside. The left-hand path is, is almost lawless, except that it still has its own boundaries. They're just not seen. And so as we explore those, the works that we produce um, will bring out those anarchic elements that other people um, can recognize that are within themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it has um, a very subtle weaving that draws in, as you said at the beginning, other people um, in the way that I would say perhaps a right-hand path doesn't. A right-hand path is something that might... Um, illuminate in a very different way. It illuminates by just being there. Whereas the left-hand path is something that you have to see for yourself. Um, you have to recognize that light um, as something that only you can switch on in yourself and pursue. And to that effect, the works um, that I've engaged in that genre 
path being um, writing. I, I mainly find my expression through writing. I did try uh, being an artist, um, drawing, um, but I'm very frustrated at that. I can't get my ideas out. So I eventually turned to words. And um, words are an expression of the inner self, the inner mind, the deep mind, the primal mind, all of these things that are deep and occult, which I would consider part of the left-hand path. It is those things that we explore that I write about, the things that are um, of the other, the things that are not of this world, mm -hmm. the things that we seek to engage with on those terms that are their terms. And when we engage those and we come back with information or knowledge or an understanding, experience, um, things that we didn't know before or didn't understand before, these are the things that I try to then put back into not just words, but into old stories, into traditional stories, into traditional poetry. Mm -hmm. It's then expressed as mythopoesis. Mm -hmm. It's a way of expressing the mysteries without revealing them so that other people can be inspired by what is written and discover that for themselves because part of that sharing process is to just seduce someone else enough to work for it mm -hmm. and that's that's what is important you can't give it to people right. they have to work for it right. right but you could pull it out with your art <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, pull it out. yeah are there any other projects that you're working on at this time that you would like to tell us about um, oh well, uh, there's the probably three um, unpublished manuscripts at the moment that are being worked on. <laughs> um, there's a couple with um, Anathema publishing. Yes. I'm not sure whether well, I'm supposed to give the titles yet, but uh, <laughs> I think they'll be up pretty soon when, when they're ready. Um, I'm very, very excited about those because they are projects that I actually began 10 years ago and had to put aside to do um, a lot of work on writing about who we are as a clan, mm -hmm. about our tradition, mm -hmm. about getting things clarified in, in the public about what we're about. So that and also building up my own place in the clan, if you like, right. um, that also has taken time. So a lot of things had to be put aside mm -hmm. uh, that I was working on. So it's been brilliant to be able to pick those things up and work on them and get them published eventually. Right. And something else that I'm working on that um, I haven't um, done before is a book of poetry, mm. um, of experiential poetry. So that will be something that will come out as well. Um, so apart from exploring more of, of what my tradition um, engages me with and writing about it, that really pretty much is my life. It's a, it's a good thing to, uh, to hear that there will be, uh, uh, you know, not just the words, but the stories and the emotions and mm -hmm. the tapping into the primal uh, parts of what it is to be human um, that we're going to be able to to read coming coming from you and from the work that you're working on. Looking forward to that. Yes, I think um, I think words that just convey um, meaning on their own don't really convey the heart and soul. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's very important for any writer to be able to express something mm -hmm. that is experiential that other people can recognize mm -hmm. in what they've done themselves mm -hmm. and also be inspired to pursue that so they recognize part of their own journey and yes. they also see a way forward to right. advance in that right and right. i think that inspires inspiration can only come through experience yes yes very much so would you um would you share with us uh you know, to, to one or two or three, whatever you're comfortable with, a couple of things that stood out for you as, as really major learnings or realizations um, 
along the journey on, you know, between the left and the right hand path in the world of the occult? Um, okay. Uh, oh, well, they, they, <laughs> that is that's a deeply very personal one, that one. I'll do my best. Um, there have been a few examples over the years that began when I was probably about seven. I used to sleepwalk mm. a lot. Um, it was quite common for me to do it every night. Um, and I would go wandering out, out into the garden, out down the road. I'd go quite some distances and, oh and the neighbors <laughs> bring me back. And um, one particular night, um, there was the most raging storm. It was quite excessively violent. So I was told afterwards. And um, it was torrential rain, lightning, thunder. I and mean, it was one of the most spectacular storms that we get over here, mm. which is very rare. And I was out sleepwalking and my parents were looking for me because they were worried because they knew I was outside in the storm. Oh, yes. And um, obviously I was still very, very young to be out there. And they eventually found me. I was under the, a holly tree at the bottom of the garden and the coal man had been an empty the chimney, we'd had chimney swept and he'd put all the soot at the bottom of the garden. And in my drenched state, as I was sleepwalking, I had rolled in the soot and got completely black. So I was covered in <laughs> soot. And I was <laughs> sat under this, this holly tree as if in trance. And I was having the most amazing um, a transpersonal experience that I could not art begin to articulate to my parents at that time. Mm -hmm. And that year was, was 1966 when Robert Cochran died. It was, it was midsummer, and that was when he died. Mm -hmm. And it was the night that he actually died. And of course, I knew none of that at the time. That's fascinating. But it marked me yeah. for a pathway into the occult world, literally at that age. Um, I mean, I had a bohemian upbringing. My parents were very liberal and um, they taught me quite a lot about contemporary religions. My grandfather was um, in the occult world in his own way mm -hmm. and taught me quite a few things. But he, this was something different. This was mm -hmm. completely different. This wiped me away. And from that point on, I pursued knowledge as if I couldn't eat enough of it. I was so hungry and I worked hard at that for the next seven years. And then, of course, I was hitting puberty. And then I had another major experience um, that was just um, what you would probably, most people would discuss as a poltergeist or out of body experience. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met um, a certain otherworldly beings okay. that informed me of the pathway that I was taking. Mm -hmm. And I perceive that now really as a conversation with your with your guardian angels, with your foil jar, with your desire, with your other, with the, with the soul spirits that exist in whatever way you wish to see them. And these were my guardians, and these were telling me, mapping out my pathway in ways that explained things that I could begin to grasp at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of steered me then into meeting other occult people and um, having an, an interest in beginning to practice certain things and, you know, mess about with things like you do when you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did that for the next seven years. And then it seems to have been a, ver a cycle thereafter. Every seven years, some enormous impact would, ex you know, really excel me on. And it, everything just seemed to push me more and more towards where I ended up. Mm -hmm. And at about the last one of those, just before I met Evan John Jones, um, I'd had another one of these experiences where I had seen him before I ever met him um, in a particular way doing a particular thing mm -hmm. and that actually came to pass in its own time that was played out 
and that for me is more than faith um which is it's it is inexplicable Mm-hmm. But it, these are the experiences that I think everyone can relate to at some point. They will recognize these initiatory stages, right. move you on to the next one, mm-hmm. and they accelerate your understanding and need as well. Mm-hmm. Everything becomes so exaggerated mm-hmm. um, and overwhelming and so encompassing that you know you need to understand that. You know you need to live in that moment every single day doing that for the rest of your life. There is no question Mm -hmm. about opting out or, well, I'm not feeling like it today because it's just there. Mm -hmm. You're so saturated in that. You've just got to do it. Mm -hmm. It's unquestionable. It is absolutely right. right. It, it's funny, you know. It, it's I'm trying to visualize the the uh, this darling little girl in the middle of a storm, <laughs> and because you must have been darling. <laughs> and, uh, my, my parents were <laughs> terrified. And and it's the symbolism is so interesting because he, you know here's this this child right who's looking at it symbolically um, off on your own. So, you know, not that there isn't help or support around you, but you're on your own journey on this one in, yeah. in the middle of a storm. And uh, again, you know, all kinds of symbolism with that. And uh, then you end up covered with, with the soot. So mm-hmm. that's, you know, that, that trip into the abyss. And then eventually you wake up <laughs> from your dream state, which again is also symbolic, uh, could be symbolic. And, um, you know, and then it's daylight and the sun shines and everything's okay. So it's it really, it's, it's amazing how much that sounds like a, an initiatory experience, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. it most yeah. certainly was. I mean, there are obviously many things that I've left out of each of those yes. um, circumstances, um, but there is enough there for people to realize mm-hmm. that that is exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. And as frightening as it can be at that point, it is that mystique, that absolute terror that allows us to make those bridges between the unconscious and conscious minds that we are actually able to think, right, I've made that, you know, synaptical click there. What am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. It's given me an insight into parts of me and parts of the other world mm-hmm. that I know I can get back to. Right. And and that's what you spend the rest of your life trying to replicate. Mm-hmm. Every day. And of course, it doesn't happen every day. Mm-hmm. Not in reality. You you get partially there. You have partial understandings. You have glimpses that again seduce you into pushing for that next big yes. impact. Yes. And that is the pace of your life. That's that's the way, way it goes until the, the last breath. And then you begin again on another journey, but one that allows you to know enough to not fear that moment too. Right. And again, I think this is typical of the left-hand path because you pursue those things, you have a completely different understanding mm-hmm. of what that um, that absolute abyss that you mentioned is, mm-hmm. because that is what it's about, seeking that darkness in that abyss. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, it is a light that is so dark, um, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that later. <laughs> well, speaking of, <laughs> you know, that's, that's uh, something, something that is very often uh, equated, uh, you know, with the abyss, with darkness, that sort of thing, is uh, the idea of evil. And, uh, you know, I would like to ask you, what do you think evil is? And, and why do you think that it is so uh, prevalent in, in our society and also in religions? Ooh, <laughs> that has been hotly debated and philosophized over, yeah. over millennia. Um, evil is For an you. absence of good, yeah. I would say. I mean, that is what um, my philosophy teacher used to say. He used to say, it's an absence of good. That's all evil is. And I used to say, but there has to be more to it. It's not good enough to just say, it's an absence of good. What does that mean? You know, how does that actually work? Mm -hmm. And I've had to muse about this myself to find an answer that I can be satisfied with. 
because yes, philosophically, it is an absence of good. It's not something that's just amoral, because amoral isn't evil. And it's not something that's the opposite of good. It's an absence of it. Mm. And what is there if there's an absence of it? Is it a space? Is it an emptiness? Is it a void? And I, I thought, well, you know, looking at what are examples of evil in the world, what is it that's causing them? Who is it? What is wrong there? What is absent in that situation that makes it an evil act? or an evil person committing that act. And looking at the way that the soul is in a person, be it either a good soul or a bad soul, mm -hmm. as we would, um, mm -hmm. I do try to avoid defining labels, but just for simplicity's yeah. sake there. But evil is almost a soullessness. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what is meant by an absence of good. Um, good doesn't necessarily mean pure, um, in the same way that bad isn't evil. Right. But evil is of itself an entirely distinct thing where there is an absence of something. Mm -hmm. And that absence, I feel, is the soul. It's a person that hasn't got that, that light within them. Mm -hmm. And the light can be, as I said earlier, either the left hand or right hand, can be either of those, the light, but they have an absence of that. So they, they have neither side to draw them forward, and so they just sink into themselves. And they have no way of, of being guided, and they have no way of understanding mm -hmm. what they're doing, because they haven't got that soul connection. Mm -hmm. And without that soul connection, they are empty. Mm -hmm. And that is then... Um, they are ha ha just given free reign to just act with impunity. To, to fill the, the emptiness. Pardon? To fill the emptiness. Yes, yeah. to fill the emptiness. Mm -hmm. Because they have that gnawing void. And I cannot imagine the despair that that must give those people. Mm -hmm. um, and the emptiness that their acts will actually not fulfill them. Um, which is why it is repeated again and again and again, and they crave ever more because they are not fulfilled. So it's um, it's an awful thing to, to ponder upon what is evil, but it, it, it is a sad thing that many things, it's a word that is used so flippantly, so easily, oh, that's evil, yes. without any comprehension that it is the most devastating thing, the most extreme form of, of nothing. Mm -hmm. And there isn't really anything in the world that is of the world that can be evil. Um, I think anything um, that anyone does has to come from a point of truth. And evil is almost not coming from any truth at all. It has nothing. Mm -hmm. It is completely empty. Thank you for sharing your, your thoughts on that. Uh, it, is, it is a heavy topic for sure, um, but uh, something that I think um, we have to always, ref you know, we have to reflect on that because it, there's always this piece about us checking ourselves, right? And checking our own, our own behaviors and our own motivations and so on. Uh, however, to, to move things on to a, a little bit of a lighter note, I think, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, um, curious, you know, what does a regular day look like for you? H how do you spend your days? Uh, oh, right. Well, around five o'clock, I would say most mornings I'm awake, um, if not five, six by the latest, but certainly five usually. Um, I'm up. Um, usually with the light, with the dawn, mm. and I will meditate, contemplate my thoughts for the day, um, get my focus for the day, mm. and then I will um, probably get a, feed my cats because by then they're aware that I'm awake, <laughs> and that, that's it, so they want their time. Yeah. Um, so I spend a, a little time with my cats. Um, my children... Um, my boys are all grown up, so they don't demand my time in the way they did when they were younger. Mm -hmm. 
And so that frees up a lot of time for me to then plan my day. And I'm normally, after breakfast, I would um, set out some work to do. I would begin researching um, something that I'd set up myself to actually pursue. <clears throat> and when I'm satisfied that I've done sufficient amounts of research and I begin to get ideas, that's when I set the books aside and just write. And I could do that for several hours or several days. Mm -hmm. It depends if the muse is with me mm -hmm. and how hard I have to work at it. Yeah. And I can literally then just sit there four hours or days just writing, mm -hmm. just in that room, in that moment. Mm -hmm. And if it's only for the few hours and rather than days, then I will finish what I'm writing and maybe take a walk in the fresh air clear my head, um, enjoy the elements, doesn't matter what the weather is like, it's all glorious, mm -hmm. um, and then come back and do some more meditation, some more, um, possibly um, sit down and contemplate again with some prayer work, some um, incantations, some um, breath work, maybe drum. Um, and then I will write again, um, do some more writing. And then just to unwind before I retire in the evening, usually around 12, I will probably just um, have some conversation with my partner, <laughs> uh, just to unwind and discuss everything that I've considered during the day and he'll do the same and we share ideas and then spire off each other and then probably end up not being able to sleep because we're generally very excited about something that we think we've discovered. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the day is very much like that. It's, it's full of wavering moods that are very quiet and contemplative and very excited mm -hmm. where we begin to do work. Um, for us, I guess, our tradition means that the work is as, as Cochrane would say, every ritual is prayer. Mm -hmm. Therefore, every act mm -hmm. is, is one where you're engaged in thought, in conscious thought mm -hmm. with, with your practice. There is no, well, this is distinct. I'm having, you know, five minutes out of that. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is involved in that process of Gnosis. So we could say that the world is our temple and life is the ritual. Just that's the way it is viewed. It is it is very profound, and it's it's every moment of every day. Um, so eventually, if I do fall asleep, which I don't sleep very much at all, um, then I dream. I have I try to lucid dream and carry on. So it is an exhausting process every day, but it's one that I've taken up since since I was very very small. Right. Um, I did eventually stop sleepwalking, uh, <laughs> then, then I stopped sleeping. From that time, literally, I've slept very little. Um, I spend most of my um, nights thinking, just generally working things through. Um, I think those are the best ways to work magics in the deep recesses of your own spaces, mm -hmm. in the quietude of solace. Yes. Uh, I think external impedimenta can often distract, often engage and, and enhance, but there are, there are other ways as well. And this is what I find so exciting about this conference with these people, because everyone does something in a different way. And there, are, there is no one way. There's all these different ways that people have discovered for themselves, that they explore these, these amazing journeys. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is is what the occult is all about. That, that individual journey that you find your way in. And I think that's fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Shani, for sharing a, a little bit of um, a little bit of your thoughts and a little glimpse into your life. Uh, really <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, I know that everybody's uh, very much looking forward to uh, meeting you at the conference and uh, it's going to be a delightful, uh, delightful three days. It will be, yes. <laughs> what, what, were, were you, uh, have you been in Canada at any time in the, in the recent past? 
I've never, never been that far up there. No, oh. I. Oh, actually, I've been to Alaska. I flew over it, <laughs> but I've never been to Canada. No, no, I didn't quite make it. Um, I went from South America up to uh, Alaska, but um, to see the lights. Oh, but no, lovely. I didn't make Canada. So this is lovely. This is lovely for me to be able to make that. Oh well, uh, on behalf of Canada, we're honoured. <laughs> <laughs> My honor. It's my honor. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again so very much. And uh, thank you to our listeners for uh, tuning in. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing all of you at the Flambeau Noir conference uh, not too far away from now. Thank mm -hmm. you, Shani, and take care, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.